Hey everyone, I'm Zeke, an engineer out of Santa Clara, California. I've felt concerned about the misinformation and confusion circling around the new coronavirus, so I figured I'd compile all the best information I could find into a single comprehensive source and shine light onto the fundamental mechanisms of the disease so that you know how to interpret the news. Now I have to warn you, you have to be reasonably intelligent to follow along. This isn't for medical professionals, that's not who this talk is for, but it isn't for idiots either. This is a really brief summary of what I'm going to say. This disease causes severe respiratory distress in about 20% of the population, requiring mechanical ventilation in about 5%, and it causes death in about 2% of the population. Because it spreads really easily and rapidly, it poses a significant threat to the medical system, vulnerable populations, and more broadly, to the stability of social order and governance. As a result, we need behavioral modifications to mitigate the spread of the disease. That comes in the form of practicing social distancing and good hygiene, avoiding crowds, avoiding travel, wearing a mask if you have one, and reusing masks. Get rest, stay healthy for your sake and for others, and please, please do not hoard masks. If you do get sick, you'll need two weeks of supply in case you need to get quarantined. Stay at home, rest, and cough or sneeze into your elbow, and disinfect frequently to avoid getting other people sick. We need to take this very seriously. That doesn't mean panicking though, because that doesn't help anybody, but don't be complacent and reckless. This is not a drill, and lives are at stake. I'll start with a quote from Harrington Emerson. As to methods, there may be a million and then some, but principles are few. The man who grasps principles can successfully select his own methods. The man who tries methods ignoring principles is sure to have trouble. When you have lots of conflicting and confusing information, it's hard to know who to trust. But if you have an underlying understanding of the principles and mechanisms at play, then you'll have a much better idea. Now my objectives for this discussion are to elevate the quality of public understanding and discourse about this topic, to survey key concepts that govern fundamental mechanisms so that you can conduct your own analysis and draw your own conclusions from incomplete, inaccurate, and conflicting information, which is the norm in a rapidly evolving pandemic, to provide inspiration and research for deeper understanding, to offer insights and some dissenting views that medical professionals are not at liberty to, dis to discuss for fear of losing their medical license, and hopefully to save lives. Let's get started. Some of the vocabulary I'll be using, a virus is an infective agent that contains genetic information that replicates within the living cells of a host. This virus is a coronavirus, and coronaviruses are a family of viruses that have a crown-like appearance when viewed under a microscope. SARS-CoV-2 is the name of this virus. It is the novel coronavirus discovered in Wuhan, China in 2019. It's about 30,000 base pairs long. It's a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus. And its diameter is about 120 nanometers, or 0.12 microns. With that diameter, you can't see it even under an optical microscope. You have to use something like a scanning electron microscope in order to view it. COVID-19 is the name of the disease that's caused by this virus. R with a subscript of zero, called r naught, is the basic reproduction rate of a pathogen within a population in the absence of vaccination or immunity. And the incubation period is the time frame after first exposure before symptoms begin to show. The symptoms of this disease are a runny nose, sore throat, cough, fever, and difficulty breathing. But I want to note, I want to make a huge note, by the time you show symptoms, you've probably already spread it. So you want to make sure that you limit your ability to spread it before you even know that you have it. Here's how the disease has been spreading. Inside China, it spread rapidly until January 23, about here, which is when Hubei province was placed on a total lockdown. It took 12 more days all the way out to here before its growth officially started to slow. Outside of China, all indicators of the growth continue to be exponential. To this date, 
151 countries out of a total of 195 globally have confirmed cases of this disease for a total of 156,000. Now, for young adults, the risk of death is pretty low at about 0.2%. However, about 10 times this many are going to experience very bad and potentially life-altering symptoms. Also, if you catch it, you're almost certain to spread it. In some way, if you catch it and spread it, you'll be responsible for someone else's death. I want to make a huge note. Mortality rate depends on the availability of medical care, which is something that we'll see again later. Now, a lot of people have drawn a comparison between this disease and seasonal flu, citing the fact that seasonal flu has already claimed the lives of a lot more people than this disease has. So if seasonal flu is not a big deal, what's the big deal here? Well, there are several major differences, namely the mortality rate of this disease is about 10 or 20 times higher than the seasonal flu. In addition, unlike the seasonal flu, which has vaccines, this disease currently has no vaccine. So the entire population is susceptible to contracting it. Because the entire population is susceptible, the spread rate of this disease is much higher than the seasonal flu. Consider this guy, Li Wen Liang, a 33 year old ophthalmologist married with one kid and a second on the way. He warned his med school buddies on WeChat, a social media app, to be careful about a new virus strain spreading in Wuhan, China. Screenshots of the app leaked and he was scolded by police for spreading rumors and he was warned about possible prosecution and he was forced to sign a confession. Well, a few days later, he contracted the virus from a patient with a high viral load. And as a result, he had a high initial exposure to the virus. He was hospitalized for about a month, after which he developed acute respiratory distress syndrome and was placed on ECMO, which is an artificial lung and an artificial heart, but he died. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that doesn't sound like a fun time to me. In addition to being age dependent, the mortality rate increases with other pre-existing conditions, namely cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, and so forth. About 6.7% of American adults have cardiovascular disease. About 10.5% have diabetes. So as a result, a large portion of the American population is at risk for severe complications and death. The main mechanism for death from the disease is ARDS, or Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. It causes rapid inflammation in the lungs, causing the microscopic air sacs in the lungs, which are called alveoli, which are responsible for gas exchange, to become damaged. The symptoms of ARDS are shortness of breath, rapid breathing, and a bluish skin coloration. The treatment for ARDS is mechanical ventilation with low pressure and tidal volume and extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECML, basically artificial lung and artificial heart. The death rate of ARDS with treatment is about 35 to 50%. And even if you do survive, recovery often comes with a decreased quality of life because of lung damage. So as citizens, both young and old, it is our responsibility to limit the spread of this disease. A lot of people have an attitude that I'm healthy, I'll probably survive, I'll take my chances, but that's the wrong mentality because if you do catch it, you'll pass it on to somebody else who won't survive. That's the issue. In the next video, we'll cover the immune response.